I think this goes for a lot of like Native American cultures. They were very connected to the earth. I think that they believe that everything is sacred and that like you should respect everything. I would guess St. Stephen's is probably, as a church, fairly interested in equality and justice. So I have a little brain teaser question for you. When did Native Americans get full religious freedom? 68. 68, you say? 78. 1878? You are correct. All right. Sad to say you're correct. What was the date? 1978. You'll be going out to a site up at the rocks where worship has taken place for at least 7,000 years. And, we, and so that's older than the pyramids, and they still continue to come to worship here. To their credit, um, for those thousands of years, it was their site. It was a Native American site. But today they want to make sure everyone knows it's everybody's site. Anyone who wants to come out to meditate, to worship, uh, is welcome to. The petroglyphs were cool. Like Sean said, they're very difficult to see in broad daylight. Uh, I expected them in like more of an enclosed area instead of just like open out on a rock. I thought it was interesting how like horns and circle feet symbolized that it was like special. Mm -hmm. And like there was, I think they had one figure that had both horns and circle feet. One of you asked a question, what makes this place so special? Um, in a word, color. They have the story, just like the biblical story of Noah's Ark, okay? Most cultures around the world have the story of the Great Flood, and the Native Americans are no exception. So they say when the Great Flood came, their ancestors went to the top of the rock, and when the water unfolded over them, they died. Their blood went down into the rock, and so this reddish color, and we'll see this red much better up a little further, uh, but this reddish color, that's the blood of their ancestors, and that makes this place super sacred. So, and it does appear this was one of the places where holy men chose to come and put their prayers and their visions and their dreams into the rock in all of North America, because we have images here all the way from the Rockies to the Appalachians. So this was a, a choice site. I mean, I know a lot more about the Native Americans now. So. Around there, it was a place of peace because, I mean, they all wanted the pipe stone and they wanted it for their rituals and things like that. And so they made it a place of peace so that enemies could put down their weapons and both go and they could quarry together. And then they would leave and they would still be enemies, but at that place, it was a place of peace, and so they wouldn't be, there wouldn't be fighting. Long, long time ago, the Creator put man on Earth, and He put us in different regions, and we were all given gifts of certain foods that were in our region, and He figured everybody would be happy and just get along. And after a while, we really got tired of eating wild rice. You know? Maybe some buffalo would be really good to go with that. So we started going out of our area and fighting with the other people. And pretty soon all the people were fighting with each other all the time. And Creator looked down, the earth ran red with the blood of our people. And he was pretty upset with us. So he called all the people together. He said, you guys gotta quit fighting. And he reached down and he broke off a piece of that blood that had coagulated and gotten hard and made a pipe. I said, I want everybody to smoke this pipe and promise to quit fighting with each other. Well, nobody would pick up that pipe because what if you smoked it and I didn't? And I might come kick your butt, you know? So everybody's just kind of sitting there trying to figure out what to do. Finally, this little kid comes running out, grabs that pipe and runs off with it. Everybody laughed. They thought that was pretty funny. And that broke the ice and they all smoked the pipe. And that's how this got to be known as a place of peace. And that's how the pipe stone got to be called bloodstone by quite a few people. You see how easy it is to start taking the corners off? We got to like get a piece of pipe stone and then uh, tried making a pipe out of it. They would use it to make pipes 
a lot. You can make these pipes that there's a big wooden thing that you'll attach at the end, and then there'll be a hole at the top, and then a hole here that you can smoke through it. And so can we buy some of these from you? Sure. He carved pipes. He carved the pipe stone into different things, whether it's like pipes, necklaces, things like that. But like to them, it's red because it's the blood of their ancestors. Supposedly when the missionaries came, everything had to represent the cross. The cross uh. was a big, big deal. So they put a nose on the pipe and you got a cross. So they go and they mine it and then they take that and he carves it into pipes and then they use that in like special rituals. We visited um, a place called the Lower Sioux Agency. We went in and we watched a movie, we read a bunch of stuff and then we like walked around. And that's when they started, we started learning a little bit more about the war that happened right in Minnesota. Did you learn anything about that, or what did you think about that? That was pretty sad. 150 years ago, like, the Dakota, they were being very oppressed because like, they were, like, they had sold a lot of their land. And so, and they were had these deals with like, the traders and people like that, but then they weren't living up to those deals. The actions of the traders went against one of the basic beliefs of Dakota culture sharing material possessions. The traders denial of that duty was socially unacceptable. And to the Sioux, such action warranted severe punishment. It was a few Dakota like boys, I'm pretty sure, and they went, at a, it was on like a dare or something like that, and they killed like a family of whites, and that's kind of what started the whole war. They returned to the Rice Creek Village, where they were from, they knew the U.S. would demand that these murders be turned over. They went on to Chief Shakopee's village. Members of the Lower Sioux Soldiers Lodge made the decision to go to war. 100 to 150 young warriors made this decision. I think he was a chief, but I've forgotten his name. He said, well, this isn't a good idea, and I know it's not, but I'm going to stand with you and I'm going to do it anyway even though I'm pretty sure we're going to lose. Chief Lilpro had been to Washington, D.C. He was trying to tell them how many whites there were. And they did not believe him. Chief Lilpro reluctantly agreed to leave them. And so they fought, and it was like six weeks long and then the Dakota ended up losing. This was the largest mass murder of white civilians by Indians in U.S. history. This attack at Fort Ridgely was the largest attack on a U.S. fort west of the Mississippi by Indians. The attack on New Ulm, I understand, is or was the largest attack by Indians on a U.S. city. Many of the Dakota fled into Dakota Territory and Canada 38 were hanged at Mankato in the largest mass execution in U.S. history. Most of the Dakota Indians were removed from the state. Hundreds died in the camps at Mankato, Fort Snelling, <coughs> Davenport, and Crow Creek. It was a tragic event for the whites and the Indians alike. He talked about the causes of the war, and once more I feel he had a kind of whitewashed view of that. Where he was talking about he kind of contradicted himself sometimes. He would be like, they weren't starving, but they were starving. And the causes were that the Native Americans attacked, but they weren't, not because they were starving, because they were malicious. But, and then later he said they were starving. It was contradictory. So did you find it to be um, truly like educational, like learning about the conflict or more uh, historical in nature or a mix of all these things? I had some background knowledge on that, like last year in English class we did a lot of stuff on that and had speakers from the Minnesota Historical Society. And so I had some background knowledge on that and some of that matched with what he said, but some of it differed. Uh, well, just overall, like, hang, like, meeting, like, 
the other kids at Spirit of St. Stephen's and um, like hanging out like in the morning and doing something and then later on in the day we would do something or just like getting a partner and like going on a walk and we had some fun stuff like we went swimming and fun stuff like that. <laughs> what was the most fun? What was fun about the camping trip? What do you remember? The pool. The pool. That was a thing. Was there anything that you really thought, mm, I wasn't really too big of a fan? Anything that you really weren't too I didn't enough? really like going to the places. No. Driving a lot. And I had to do it two hour drive back to the campsite, which is as long as it takes to get home, even less. So. So a lot of driving, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. What kind of things do you remember that was a lot of fun on the trip? Uh, swimming at the water park that we found because the beach was kind of not that good. It was really fun. What else, what else was fun about the trip? Um, getting to know other people in the church better. So was it, did you feel like it was time well spent? It was a good, good thing to do? Yeah, yeah. I liked the water war at the end. I enjoyed pulling over on the side of the road for a dance party. Um, those two things were fun. I enjoyed those.